My name is Christian Chung, and I'm a PhD student here at the Human Performance and Health Research Laboratory. Today, I'm going to be talking about a recent study from our lab, which we published in the European Journal of Applied Physiology in collaboration with colleagues from Michigan State University and FINA, the Global Governing Body for Professional Aquatic Sports. As you can see from the title, we examine the relationship between arterial stiffness and swimming training in a group of elite aquatic athletes. Before I get into the details of what we did in this study, I want you to consider a few questions. First, ask yourself, what is it that makes athletes so unique and good at what they do? There are many right answers, but what I want to focus on today is one of the biggest keys to athlete success, training. Simply put, High-level athletes complete extremely large amounts of training. The second question I want to ask is, do you think that different types of training have different effects on the body? Of course they do. There's a reason that weightlifters lift and runners run. Previous research has explored this concept, and one of the hallmark adaptations to training is a phenomenon referred to as athlete's heart. As you can see in the ultrasound images of hearts shown here, athletes tend to develop very large and strong hearts compared to the general population. Work in this area has shown us that adaptations to the cardiovascular system, specifically the heart, are dependent on the hemodynamic demands of an athlete's training. While athlete's heart isn't the focus of this study, it demonstrates an important concept it shows us that the cardiovascular system adapts to the stimuli it is faced with, which depends on the type of exercise we do. That brings us to our study. We wanted to extend this knowledge by asking, do large volumes of swimming training result in unique adaptations to the cardiovascular system, and more specifically, our arteries? Swimming training might elicit unique adaptations in our arteries for a few different reasons. Swimming is generally performed in horizontal body positions and requires you to perform controlled breathing patterns. Additionally, hydrostatic forces from submersion in water cause a shift of fluid from our tissues into the bloodstream. Collectively, these factors result in a greater return of blood to the heart during swimming compared to other forms of exercise. The consequence of this is greater pumping of blood to our muscles during swimming. To answer our research question, we closely examined the arteries of professional pool swimmers, long-distance open water swimmers, and water polo players. We chose these groups because of the different requirements of their sports and unique training regimes. Long-distance open water swimmers compete in extremely long swimming races lasting hours, and therefore do the most swimming training. Traditional swimming races are shorter, so swimmers tend to do slightly less swim training, but still do plenty themselves. Water polo players do even less swimming, since their training focuses more time on team tactics, and much of their sport involves treading water in upright positions. Given the differences between the training of each of these athlete groups, we hypothesize that open water swimmers would show the most extreme adaptations, followed by swimmers, then water polo players. At this point, you might be asking yourself, what adaptations did we look for? As I mentioned before, we examined athletes' arteries. More specifically, we examined how stiff athletes' arteries were and how much extra pressure the stiffness of an athlete's artery creates. Our measure of stiffness is called pulse wave velocity. and Our measure of the extra pressure this stiffness creates is called augmentation index. Higher pulse wave velocity indicates stiffer arteries, and higher augmentation index represents greater pressure. Let's dive into what we found. In figure A, you'll see that as we expected, athletes from each sport completed different amounts of swim training, which matched the demands of their sport. Open water athletes spent the most time training, followed by swimmers, and then water polo players. In figure B, you can see that all athletes completed similar amounts of time resistance training. When it comes to total swimming distance, you'll see that figure C shows that open water swimmers swim the greatest distance each week, followed by swimmers and then water polo players. 
despite this pattern, it is important to note that all athletes did lots of training. Although open water swimmers spent over 25 hours per week swimming, water polo players still spent over 15 hours per week swimming. Now let's take a look whether these differing amounts of swimming training translate to differences in pulse wave velocity or augmentation index. Pulse wave velocity was mostly similar between all of the athlete groups we examined, with one exception. Male pool swimmers had significantly lower pulse wave velocity than male water polo players. In female athletes, there were no differences between athlete groups, but all female athletes had lower pulse wave velocity than all male athletes. This difference between males and females has been shown previously in large populations, so this result isn't particularly surprising. Although pulse wave velocity was largely similar between athletes, augmentation index, which once again you can think of as extra pressure in the arteries, was not similar between groups. In figure A, we can see that augmentation index was lower in open water swimmers compared to water polo players and swimmers in male and female athletes, respectively. Further supporting this finding, we see that when we adjust augmentation index for heart rate, which is known to affect augmentation index, augmentation index is also lower in female open water swimmers compared to female water polo players. Do you remember our initial research question? We want to know if the amount of swim training athletes do is related to adaptations in the arteries. This brings me to our most important finding. When we look at the relationship between total swimming distance completed per week and augmentation index in all athletes, regardless of sport or sex, we see that more swimming training is associated with lower augmentation index. This suggests that swimming training is associated with arterial adaptations in a dose-response manner. Before we can accept this finding as a fact, it's important to consider the main limitation of our study. The biggest limitation we face is the fact that our study is cross-sectional, and therefore we can't know for sure if swim training causes these arterial adaptations, or if the athletes who swim the most just happen to have the lowest augmentation index. As they say, correlation is not causation. So where do we go from here? Future studies need to establish whether there is a cause and effect relationship between swimming training and these arterial adaptations, and if so, what mechanisms underlie this relationship? That concludes this knowledge translation video from the Human Performance and Health Research Laboratory. Stay tuned for more knowledge translation videos about our research in the future. Thanks for watching and see you next time.